So that's the first violin part, straight through with the repeats. I'm going to go through now and just kind of break it up so each of you can know what to look for when you practice. Uh, I have many different shots, something a little bit closer, something a little bit fuller, and then actually another one over here that you can get um, a better shot of the fingers. So um, with all the different camera angles, I'll be jumping from different ones to another. So that way you can, whenever I'm talking about something specifically, you can also see what I'm working on. First of all, I'm going to start with the beginning of the rondo. And you probably can't really see it very well on that screen, but I'll, I'll get to something else. But, but anyways, at the beginning of the rondo, it starts with your fourth finger. I would definitely do fourth fingers. There's kind of a big controversy. I, I know in middle school, some teachers say, you must do fourth fingers. Some others say, you got to do open strings. Well, I'm saying you have to do both, and you have to know which ones you should be doing. But most importantly, you should listen to your, your music teacher. But um, for me, if it's repeated notes, I tend to always use my fourth finger. When it's just a single note by itself and it's convenient, I'll do an open string. But generally, the timbre of the open string tends to be very bright. Whereas if you use your fourth finger, First of all, you can also add a little bit more warmth with vibrato. You can also add just um, a different timbre, a, a warmer, deeper kind of timbre if you stay on the previous string and just use your fourth finger. So for the beginning, I would definitely use the fourth finger. Uh, we also have the hooks, which I refer to it. Some other teachers call it lore or detache uh, lance. Um, but either way, it's just going to be the same thing as a slur, but you have to stop your bow in between. So this one has to be more articulate. I tend to think of the detache lance as something that's a little bit shorter, where you hear a clean, distinct up, up, beginning of each eighth note. Whereas uh, the lore would be more smooth, more connected. Right? Or. So to do that, you just have to give a little bit more first finger weight. And so we hear a good, clean attack. Right? Now, for instance, that last A I just left off of, I do an open A there because you're going to be moving on to the A string. And much of the A string, you have to be very careful because um, we, as um, beginning students or novice students, we tend to play everything with the major finger pattern. And that major finger pattern is going to get us into trouble, especially with this piece, which is in the key of G major. And we can tell because it has one sharp in the key signature. So that one sharp implies that it's only F sharps that you're going to play. So if we're on the A string, then we need to make sure it's a C natural. So we do that low two. So high two on the D string, low two on the A string. And consequently, on the E string, it's not G sharp, which is high two. Now it's G natural. And then for the G string, this is the tricky part. Your second finger, when it's low, is actually playing B flat. And when it's high, it's B natural. And since there are no B flats in the key signature, and there are no B sharps in the key signature, we are going to do a high two on the G string as well. So, aside from that, the first line of Rondo is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Just be careful of those low twos. Moving on to the second line. Second line is very similar to the opening. We have that hook again. Right? And you definitely want to use your fourth finger because it's going to set you up for the second bar of the second line, which has the, the ornamentation or the grace notes is what we refer to. So that grace note, you see D, E, D. You have to make sure that you get those right on the beat and as quick as you can. And first violins, you guys are lucky. You're the only ones that get to do this. So make sure you get that grace note as quick as you can. So in order to practice this, 
I would just practice what we call trills and get that fourth finger to start moving faster. So you can do some trill exercises by setting that D and just practice going as fast as you can back and forth. And when you want to go fast, you should not be thinking about pushing down rather than lifting up. So always think about lifting up whenever you want to go fast. So, grace note, make sure it's on the beat rather than before the beat. Some, some people like to feel it before the beat. Um, I'll give you an example. If it's one, two, three, four, that would be before the beat because you're landing on the principal note, the D, afterwards, which we don't want to do. We want to feel it on the beat. I'm kind of emphasizing it so you can feel it, but that's kind of what we're aiming for. Now, when you get to that third bar, you know, there's a lot of teachers, and I'm one, that will be very particular about how my students place their fingers. So I want you, and I want, ideally, my students to feel that third finger go down for the D, but then know where you're gonna go for your second finger for the G natural. So it's a good thing to keep fingers down and then only take the fingers that you need to move. So when you're playing, I just take that second finger across because you're coming right back to the same note, which is D. So and you gotta make sure you keep a good tunnel as you do it. And that takes us through the first ending, which is the next line. So be very careful about keeping fingers down. Um, and then also watch for all those C naturals. Um, then we have to do the whole beginning one more time and take the second ending. So when you get to the second ending, it says, RIT, which stands for retardando, which means to slow down uh, gradually. And it says last time. So don't do it the first time. In fact, we also have a fermata, and I wrote in um, on my music, in which I'm going to post up online so everyone can download and see all the, the little notes I made. Um, last time. So when you see last time, don't play it on the first time or when we go through, but once we come down to the bottom of the page and we go back up for the DC, then we're gonna take the ritardando and also hold the fermata. Um, I'm actually getting a little bit ahead of myself and I completely forgot to t talk about the dotted quarter notes. So in measure five, six, measure six, we have these dotted quarter notes. So we had that same trill, or sorry, not trill, uh, grace note, but you have to save your bow on these dotted quarter notes and then be light on the eighth notes to follow because we don't want that eighth note to be louder than the principal or the um, dominant note, which is the downbeat of the measure, which is the D. So we want to hear this be the dominant note, that D, and then not the C, so not to have it stick out, which is easy to do, and a lot of kids will play where they give a big up bow so that they can get back to the frog. So we have to be conservative with our bowing and then also be sensitive to how the music should sound. So we want to have a good principal note, the D, and then relax on the up bow or the C for the eighth note. So it's very tricky and I would practice things like major since it's our key. Just knowing to make the, the up bows very light. Um, and then also a good way is to practice it incorrectly so you know what not to do. But uh, make sure you practice correctly more times than incorrectly. So incorrectly would sound like this. It's very not non-musical. So try and do and 
have a little bit more flexibility in your bow hand and just relax on those up bows. Think light. And if you're just thinking light, it will come out that way. Um, going on, so after the third line, after the first and second ending, we come to the pickups to measure 13. So be very careful, the, the measure of the fermata only has three beats, and in this music we're in 4-4 four, four time, so we still have one more beat, which is the pickup to measure 13, in which they placed it not in the same bar as, um, as measure 12, but there is that pickup written below. I think for rehearsal reasons, but um, just be aware that those two eighth notes before measure 13 are in fact the pickups. So here we come into the binary um, or the second section of our rondo. So here's the second theme. whole little phrase there. When you do this, and I probably should backtrack a little bit, um, when you're playing, you want the quarter notes to be what's called um, detache, uh, which means to be more detached. In fact, it needs to be more than just detache, and it has to have a little bit of a bite to each beginning and a clear end before you start the next one. So we call that martelet. So quarter notes need to feel that martelet um, style, whereas the eighth notes need to be more of the legato detaché feel, so it has to be more connected, even though it's separate bows, which that's what detaché means. It means detached, but still smooth. Okay, so when we get to measure 13, actually the entire piece, we want to be thinking just in general with those two concepts. So quarter notes have to be more um, martelé, whereas the eighth notes can be more um, detaché and legato. So I'll play that one more time so you can get the idea. Right? And then when you have those two eighth note hooks, and there's two of them in that line, you have the repeated Ds in measure 13, and also in measure 15 you have A, B that are hooked up bow. So make sure that we have good, clear distinction on those hooks so that they kind of pop out. Um, they don't need to be any louder, but they need to be more articulate. Same thing for the following line. It's very similar, but it's the second half of that phrase. And then you have a retake. And then we have that same idea, so the A theme comes back. So we have... Then we get into the C section. And this C section, uh, this is the tertiary section, um, has all the dynamics and uh, with Moray he tends to play around with these dynamics and I want you guys to really emphasize them. So it's less than what we just ended with, so like a mezzo forte um, and we still, now our eighth notes are even slurred together so it's not um, so much detaché but it's a lot smoother. And then when we have all the same, actually the new thing is the F naturals. So uh, on the E string is marked in F natural, so you have to get the low ones. So I would go back, and I'm going to have a separate video to talk about all the different finger patterns, but we have that major finger pattern. On the A and E string, we have to do minor because it's C naturals and G naturals. But now we have an F natural, so instead of playing F sharp here, we need to now lower that first finger back. So when we're playing, um, Let's make sure that we're thinking about those low ones, and then also when you come back to the A string, don't forget to bring it back up. I like to use my thumb as an anchor, kind of like how when you go out with a ship into the sea, you place an anchor down to keep the ship from moving. 
I, I know many of you probably haven't been out to see. I've only gone a couple times myself and we never used an anchor. But anyways, uh, the anchor really ties down the ship, doesn't let it move around. Same thing with our hand, that thumb has to be an anchor. And I like to use it as a reference point. So wherever my first finger lines up on the fingerboard, I like to make that uh, where the thumb goes. So if we ever have to move the first finger to a low position, then we know exactly where to come back up to because your thumb is keeping its place. So for, for this next line, I'll play a little bit um, and then just kind of show you how that first finger moves. So when you play, It's good to practice really slow and make sure that those fingers are doing exactly what you're thinking. Getting that first finger to move back and bring it back up. Because there's that B and you have to make sure it's right in tune. So if you get it slow then you can start speeding it up and then eventually get it in time. the piano which I like to think of as an echo so we, whenever you have echoes you have it stated loudly then it's the same thing echo softly and then he does he goes back into the forte section and then he comes back and forth and does a lot of these echoes so this whole section be careful of the F naturals again think about those low twos anytime you have low two and you're going to three make sure you're stretching so that it's in tune Oftentimes we forget to stretch and then we get something similar to this. I don't know if you can hear it, but it doesn't sound quite right. It's very flat. So you have to be listening. And I would practice those finger exercises just so that you really feel comfortable about stretching those third fingers and stretching those fourth fingers. So that's something to look for there. Echo. So I, I'm really, I, I want you guys to exaggerate it because when we have 60 kids up on stage, everyone does that echo, it's going to be very, very effective. And to make it more exaggerated, we're going to use fuller bows when it's a mezzo forte so that we're getting a good tone. And then when you come to the piano, it's after a down bow. So I want you guys to get to the tip and then just use very little bow and just stay at the tip for the piano. Eat, and you can even exaggerate it so much that you can't really hear yourself over everybody else. So when there's 60 people playing, 60 people at a piano is still going to be somewhat loud. And you should be listening more to them uh, when it's piano than just yourself. So exaggerate as much as you can. Get used to it because this kind of stuff is only going to set you apart from other students when you do your videotaped auditions. So. That takes through that whole little echo section. Um, what I would suggest is be very careful about the notes first, practice that up, and then come back and then put in all the dynamics and make it musical. Um, when you're on the E string, be careful because it is F naturals for this whole section. It is G natural, but anytime you're doing a low one to a low two, you have to remember that it's not just um, low two touching low one, but that low one to low two is a good whole step. 
So wherever your first finger was, where your thumb is, you feel that low two touch. But when it's a low one, that low two still stays in the same place. So you're gonna make it a low one. You still have to stretch for low two. Don't do a super stretch, but stretch just enough. And then when you go to a three as well, you have to stretch. So anytime you're doing a low two to three, you have to stretch. Anytime you're doing a low one to two, you have to stretch. But most importantly, use your ear, listen, make sure it's in tune, um, and then be thinking about your whole steps and a half steps. Um, so we come back to these dotted quarter note eighth notes. In fact, we have two of uh, those sets in a row. I'll measure 40, 41, 42, 43. Make sure that we're not pushing those up bows. So you get to the frog. We want to be light. And then I added in a little bit because we kind of have this build up, and I feel like it should have a build up coming into the fortissimo, which comes back to the DS or the, the main theme. So um, on measure 44, I want the second beat. So after the quarter note, after the first quarter note, I want you to mark it down to a piano and the crescendo up until measure 46 once you hit to that fortissimo. So it's going to sound like this. I hope that was helpful. Um, find the time to practice it. Of course, uh, this video, if you're going to be practicing along with it, I would highly recommend that you have that uh, mouse out or your keyboard so you can pause the videos as quickly as possible uh, because don't practice as quick as you can. In fact, the best thing to do is just to take one line at a time. Even at that, take just two measures, one measure, work out tough spots, and remember that each time you hit a problem, the problem only lies between two notes. The note you know how to play and the one that we make a mistake on. So work out those two notes and then eventually you'll build up on that success and get the whole thing done. Um, it, is, it takes lots and lots of time of practice. Um, I didn't get as good as I am just in one night. It took me several, several years uh, of diligent practicing. So. Best of luck. Uh, if you have any questions, you may leave some comments in Google Classroom. Uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, it is a forum, so others can get on there and um, chat as well. Um, do make sure, if you have any specific uh, comments from me, that you uh, submit it, and then um, I will be sure to get back to you uh, as soon as possible.